Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Ohioan Podcast. Craig Schaub here with George Thomas, our Akron Beacon Journal film critic. It's been a lot. Of, it's been a while. It's been a few weeks since we last chatted. We've uh, gone through the holiday season. We're in the new year now, George. Happy holidays and happy new year. How are you doing? I'm well rested because I was off from the mid-December until this past month, this past yes. Tuesday. Yes, so, so was I. Yes, I was. I was on the company furlough at the end of the week, at uh, the end of the last week of December, and uh, went back to Ohio. So I was near you and uh, visited some family, but back down here in Middle Tennessee. And uh, well, you know, now that we've exchanged pleasantries, let's get right to it. We're talking all things streaming this time around, and we'll talk a little bit of movies as well with some of your favorite picks from last year. But we're going to talk about uh, some streaming because I know. We've talked about this plenty of times. January is like a death month for movies. So there's not a whole lot going on for you to watch or, you know, a lot of genre movies that you don't really like to watch, like the horror movies and slasher films. So we will talk streaming this week. And you have a couple of streaming picks uh, or that you've uh, streaming titles that you've seen. Uh, Tell us a little bit about Jack Ryan and then you can kind of transition right into the other one as well. Well, Jack Ryan, you know, it's just continuation of of that i don't know what to call jack ryan is it series is it a franchise what it, it i guess you could call it a franchise it's been around for a while you know but uh john krasinski is now jack ryan after the is it four or five other actors who have been him let's see alec baldwin harrison yeah. ford ben affleck yeah. chris pine right number yeah. five this is number five yeah okay but um, he's back, and it's an episode, eight episode run on HBO Prime this time. And what a big surprise! It has to deal with Russian spies and espionage and all sorts of fun <laughs> stuff like that. I know yeah. you're shocked, right? You know well, shocked. hey, at least they don't make up a country like you know some other franchises and or properties do, where they don't want to step on the international toes, especially in the film world. They don't want to step on international film box office. So they uh, make up a country in Eastern Europe and, you know, so good for them to actually say this is Russia. Yeah. It's, it's Russia. And uh, now Russia's doing Russian things. Right. Ooh, I'm going to get internet trolls for that. Aren't I? <laughs> now what it is, it's a Russian old guard that's looking to reform the Soviet Union. That uh, sounds familiar. <laughs> you know, te- you know, you got to imagine that somewhere along the way, some writer saw what what's what what's happening in 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 the Ukraine and thought, you know, maybe predicted a couple things, you know, but it, yeah. re- Ukraine isn't the country involved this time around. I I think it's Hungary. Now, I watched this show a, a, a good month ago. It, it came out December 21st. I had review access. So if I I slip up on, on so. country, but, you know, there, it's about Russian hardliners who want to reform the Soviet Union. The old Russian glory, yada, right. yada, yada, that kind of stuff. And, you know, Jack Ryan and his buddy James Greer have to save the day. Right. <laughs> what a shock there. At, at this point, season three, you now season one was a nice revelation. Uh, season three at this point is comfort food. Okay. I mean, th- this is a series I look forward to each and every time it comes comes around simply because you can slip it on like a comfortable pair of pajamas, binge it without guilt, and and know that it's pure entertainment. Krasinski's right. got um, great chemistry with, with Wendell Pierce. It's got nice action. This, this time around, it builds... Excuse me. It's to a okay. slow burn. Right. It builds to something. And... It, it, it's a nice blend of action, humor, all this, and you know, like I said, it's it's 
televised comfort food. Yeah. And, and well, I have to, yeah, I mean, I have to admit, I've never, I have not watched the Krasinski series. And I, I have to also admit, I did not watch the Chris Pine Shadow Recruit film. So I, I'm probably more in the Harrison Ford, Ben Affleck run. You know, I mean, does do you think Jack Ryan works better on the small screen? I mean, has it worked better for you as these episodic runs versus maybe the back and forth between a Harrison Ford, a Baldwin, a, you know, Pine, Affleck. I mean, how do you kind of perceive this character? You know, the, the character, and by the way, I, Shadow Recruit is a movie. It's the next, It's directed by Kenneth Branagh, but Chris right. Pine was, pr- Chris Pine was per- perfect in the role. He really was. So if you get a chance, check that out. I enjoyed okay. that one. The movie... I enjoyed him. The movie had its issues, but um, you know, some of this stuff is pretty dense for a two hour, two hour and 15 minute movie. You know what I mean? Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. I like the, excuse me. (laughs) Okay. I think I won't die now. (laughs) And also, Saturday, I like the fact that it, the plot can unfold at a, a leisurely p- pace. You know what I mean? Right, right. Whereas in a, in a film, if you're really not paying attention, you could miss something. Right. And even with this, because of the the twists and turns are so um, pronounced, you could end up missing something. Because there are a couple times I had to ask my wife, what happened? I don't remember that. You know, right. We didn't binge it all in one night. I think it, we actually took two weekends to, to knock it out. Okay. And I, I had to have my memory ref- refresh in a couple twists and turns. Um, but because they haven't been able to do the movies right recently, I'll take this. Okay. Any day of the week, I'll take it. Primarily because of Krasinski and, 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 and Wendell Pierce. Does, does this, uh, and you know, obviously we live in an era where streaming, you don't really get like six, seven, eight, nine season runs. I, I'm not sure if like Prime is is ready to call it quits on this, but I mean, does this, do you think this is going to continue on in this franchise form as a series with Krasinski? Obviously, he's gotten very popular over the years here with being a director and still a star in movies and TV. Uh, but, you know, does this have staying power for multiple seasons beyond this? Or is this kind of a swan song for it? I'm pretty sure it's still one of Amazon Prime's most popular right. shows. Right. So, yeah. I mean, if I'm Krasinski, if they're going to let you film these, I think the last season was out two years ago. If they're going to let let you film these like they're nothing more than a movie sequel at your pace, why would you give it up? Right, and if on H uh, Amazon Prime's end, if it's still bringing you notoriety and and eyeballs, why would you give it up? It's my fervent hope that it's it's around for at least a couple more seasons. Okay. Any uh, any hopes for a uh, a film version of this Jack Ryan with with Krasinski, or do you prefer just leaving it the way it is and not really needing to either? do like a one-off film or transition into a film franchise or whatever they'd like to do? You know, that's interesting because the series concentrates on Jack before he's married. Now, it would be interesting that if they could take it up, move it to the big screen after he's married. Okay. And dealing with all this stuff. I could, I could, I could see that happening and I'm here for it. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, don't you think? Could, with, yeah. With, I mean, with, you know. With Krasinski directing. Right. And, you know, I mean, he's he's got the acting chops, obviously, and he's certainly a very capable director. So it, it just, you know, I mean, and, and I think the good thing is, is there's probably some wiggle room because Amazon Prime has control over this. They can continue doing what they're doing and and making good season after season, or they, you know, like you said, maybe they can move the story forward and here we go. Here's a a film franchise or at least a one-off, 
you know, to give you that sort of traditional Jack Ryan, like you've seen it with Harrison Ford or Ben Affleck or Chris Pratt or uh, Chris Pine or, you know, whoever, you know, whoever you decide, but Krasinski seems to be a good, uh, you know, good fit. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I guess he would call him sort of a, I, I guess I look when I first, you know, obviously Ben Affleck was, you know, Chris Pine are certain, you know, athletic body types, but, you know, Harrison Ford wasn't like the young man, Harrison Ford playing, playing this character. So it kind of was like the uh, Jason Bourne of of the Jack Ryan character when you went to, you know, sort of that more action hero kind of yeah. physique. This is probably even more so almost the Daniel Craig of James Bond, where, you know, you want James Bond to look like he could, you know, kill everybody like he actually can with his bare hands. And I think that's kind of what Daniel Craig did for the James Bond character, especially transitioning it from Pierce Brosnan, who was a great James Bond. I mean, as a James Bond, that's what you kind of think of him as. But, you know, obviously they take it into the 21st century. And maybe this is what they've done here with Krasinski as Jack Ryan being able to do that physicality that you kind of want out of your action hero. Well, the physicality is there, but still, the, the, the Jack Ryan character, and I don't know if it was due to where they picked it up or where the franchise started, was always more cerebral than anything else. Right, and Harrison Ford was perfect for that. And if anything, it's a blend of right. the cerebral, because that's definitely there. Mm-hmm. Jack Ryan knows he's the smartest dude in the room. Right. Trust me. With a little bit of the action hero. Right. So. Okay. Overall, uh, you know, you've had a chance to watch us. Uh, is this, uh, again, like you, know, you said, comfort, uh, you know, sort of that comfort viewing. I'm assuming you recommend. Uh, oh, yeah. It's everybody get in, yeah, if, if not involved like me, maybe I should start binge watching uh, seasons one and two here to get caught up. So it's, it's a solid B plus. It okay. really is. All right. And then uh, what else do you have? You you uh, visited Peacock here for your next pick. What what do you have for, from Peacock? Yeah, which I think is only the second time I viewed a series of Peacock <laughs> all year. The other being The Fresh Prince. Um, ah, yes. Yeah, Bel Air. Which should be coming back here in the uh, coming months. So very I, excited about I that. I still haven't watched those last two episodes because I know they're going to yeah. wipe me out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they will. So, but, um, you know, Peacock, it's it's odd with this one because I don't, are you familiar with the movie The Best Man released in 1999? I'm familiar, but I can't be, I can't say that I watched it. Okay, The Best Man and came out in 1999, directed by Malcolm D. Lee, who is Spike Lee's cousin. Now, you know, in 1999, God. That's that's twenty four. That's all, that's twenty four years ago. <laughs> I reviewed this in theaters, man. <laughs> I was in high school at that time. So you know, back then we were still getting. When I say we, I mean the black audience was still getting stereotypical roles, right? Um, stereotypical plots. And to some degree, a great degree, we are still. Now, here's what I appreciate about The Best Man. Number one, the cast, Tay Tay Diggs, Morris Chestnut, Regina Hall, Terrence Howard, who has Cleveland roots, um, Sanaa Lathan, Mia Long, Harold Perrineau, who's a hell of an actor, right? Tremendous cast. And I knew them back then. Right. But they were well-known to the black community, black movie fans, black black television series fans. But see, one thing that really blew me away is that this was one of the first times we're seeing black professionals or black people aspiring to be professionals because they're that they're they're in, in that instance, in the first movie, they're young. They're just starting out. Um, Morris Chestnut's character, Lance, you know, in, in, to, to some degree, that's a, is a stereotypical character because he's a professional athlete. Everybody else? I 
everybody else, lawyer, doctor, right. teacher. And it, it was a breath of fresh air. And the movie was just about being, it was just about being, growing, and and starting their lives with the backdrop being this wedding. Um, the foot, Lance's wedding, the football player's wedding, to his his fiance, and how the past came back to spook that, in in that his best man, it turns out, when he and his fiance were on a break, his best man, Tay Diggs, slept mm-hmm. with his fiance. So that provided all the drama there, but it was intelligent. The humor was there. It was right. at times heartbreaking, thoroughly enjoyable film. Um, I don't want to say the black version of anything, but it reminded me a lot of the big chill. That's the best way to put it. Okay. <laughs> Come back about, I want to say about 10 years ago, The Best Men Christmas. And the way this is playing out, apparently, is Malcolm D. Lee at some point, it seems like, decided to pick these characters up at various stages of life. Best Men Christmas, they're looking at where they stand, starting their family, blah, blah, blah. That beginning's taking root, blah, blah, blah. The Best Men in the final chapters, things have taken root. Lance has retired from the NFL. Um, The Tay Diggs character is on the verge of signing a major movie deal for one of his books. Um, The Harold Perrineau character has a chain of charter schools and is a very successful lawyer. And it's look, it looks forward to legacy, Mm -hmm. to what this all means, what they've been able to accomplish. And, 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 you know, for me, as an African American, it remains a breath of fresh air because it's it's stuff that I'm contemplating now. I've got a son who's getting married. I got an, another son who just finished high school, and you know I spend a lot of time looking at how my life is set up for when I'm done with all this. Right. You know what I mean. Right. And what have I accomplished? Now, other than my two sons in my marriage. I look to with probably by now 7,000 articles in the Akron Beacon Journal archives. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that's the allure with this. The performances are still there. The chemistry is still there. It's raw, but it's intelligent. And I enjoy Every second I've seen so far, okay, because it's a it's an eight it's an eight episode scene, right. which allows it to f- flow at a more leisurely pace. And, yeah. it, and I'm enjoying that because it lets you spend more time with these characters. You know, can, you know, hearing you talk about that kind of goes to show you that you don't necessarily have to be uh, um, an action blockbuster to deliver the goods on a sequel or in this case, uh, you know, a movie turned into TV franchise or series now. So it's, it's kind of refreshing that because at first on the surface, you probably think, well, do we really need 23, 24 years later, a TV series of, of these characters? But again, if things are done the right way and you have compelling characters, that's what's going to make something interesting. And, you know, whether it's an action movie or not, you can, you can generate an audience and have, have them respond to it. Like you, you know, are saying that you did. So, um, you know, it's kind of refreshing to see that, you know, and I think, you know, we, we talked about uh, Bel Air last year where it, it really kind of came out of left field as a, you know, sort of a different take on that, that character and a different take on that world that we live in now in the 21st century versus, you know, sort of the happy go lucky hijinks with obviously some drama in that initial run with Fresh Prince of Bel Air. But uh, this time we get a little bit more hardened look at, you know, growing up as a black man or black woman in this country. Now, I, and, and, you know, I'm not, I go back and forth. 
in that to me, for the most part, talent is talent. Mm-hmm. Stories are universal. Right. And but I think I think it was very important that this came from a black director. Sure. Because there are certain things you just understand and, and I giving props to Malcolm D. Lee and and being able to carry these characters through over twenty something yeah, right. and, and keep them fresh. So yeah. not easy to do. No. Well, uh, have you seen the entire run or are you uh catching up on everything or have you how far along are you through this? I've got two episodes left of okay. of eight. So okay. Uh, so far, but uh, a good recommendation here for people to catch if they're looking for uh, maybe a trip down Nostalgia Lane if you watch the uh, the original movie. Um, it stands on its own, but yeah, sure. Okay. Absolutely. Well, um, so we get that out of the way, and obviously we're in a new year. Uh, it's a sort of a weaker schedule for the movie releases, unless you're interested in seeing Megan, the robot slasher movie or whatever that is i don't I'm know waiting that. for cocaine bear but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> hey that's 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 set my my now home state of tennessee so yeah i'm, I'm interested in uh in that but we we did want to kind of recap a little bit on the 2022 year in film and streaming and television um what are some of your favorite things and this could be going back and forth between film television streaming whatever you watched what are some of your favorite things that you watched last year, George? Well, I'm going to be honest with you because movie-wise, I feel guilty because the, the movie year was funky. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, the release schedule was eh. Yeah. There wasn't as many releases. I didn't see as much as I normally see in a given year. Right. Um, movie-wise, I don't even have a top 10 this year. Right. If I'm choosing what I like best, uh, the Fableman's, mm-hmm. that sticks with me. Um, primarily because I'm a Spielberg junkie, and that's that's sure. absolutely the most personal thing he's ever done. Right. Um, the Batman, I months later can't shake it. I really yeah. can't. Yeah. Especially with all the DC upheaval going on right now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree with you on Batman wholeheartedly. That was, uh, I was getting a little bit of that Spider Man fatigue with Batman, thinking, do we really need more Batman? But I, I probably should have thought, you know, Matt Reeves knows what he's doing. And he made, like, you know, the, the Nolan Batmans, with the exception maybe of The Dark Knight Rises, are better than this Batman. But that's high praise because. Batman Begins and The Dark Knight are just absolutely dynamite entertainment. Some of the best superhero movies you will ever see. But this Batman really felt like a like what Batman was as a comic. A detective yeah. kind of snuffing out the bad guys, getting the physicality when need be, but also sort of using his, his keen intellect to solve crimes. And that's probably the exact reason why the Riddler was among the villains in this first film is you wanted to challenge the Batman's intellect, even in year two of being Batman like this is. Um, fine turns from Pattinson as Batman. Paul Dano, Dano was great as uh, the Riddler. Paul Dano. Talk, Colin but, Farrell, though, too, was great yeah. as the Penguin. But see, let's let, let, stick on Paul Dano for a minute. The range from the Riddler to Steven Spielberg's father. Right, right. I yeah. mean, he he deserves awards consideration, I think. But he certainly sorry, does. I don't. I don't know that he'll score anything for the Batman, but I don't think that that's an indictment on that performance not being good enough. Because I know a lot of people were very interested to see if this was going to be a Heath Ledger type, yeah, Dark Knight awesome villain turn and it was like i you know paul dano was great as the riddler it just probably going to get squeezed out but that's the way the world works sometimes in the movie business where and he might squeeze himself out with the fablemans honestly so um you know 
a great performance. It probably was a scotch too long for my liking, but I will say that there wasn't a whole lot that I would say didn't work. It just probably could have gotten trimmed down. I know, I think when you initially reviewed it, um, you had said you probably weren't that in love with what they did with Catwoman, or at least didn't I think, think I, she really mattered as much. No, I, I did. I probably, I thought she was probably more pertinent to the story than you might have thought. Um, and Zoe Kravitz was great as Catwoman. I know you said she was great too, but maybe her story arc just. Mm. Mm. But they, overall, they could have put though, anybody in that role, they really right, could have. right, they could have. But at the end of the day, I think. I I don't know what this is going to be in the James Gunn led DC universe. There's talks that maybe they'll let this be what it is or whatever. Maybe it'll be the Batman of this James Gunn universe. Who knows? I do. If, as long as they keep getting to make movies in this, this Batman universe, I don't really care how it stacks up with the James Gunn stuff. I really don't. I just want to see more give Matt Reeves his money let him go to do his work. You see, you know, I, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but you know what I like about it? The one point I don't think I ever hit on was the fact that you, 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 in, in Nolan's Batman, for instance, he sets out, Bruce Wayne Batman sets out to be a hero. Right. This one has, is under no illusions about being a hero. It's about vengeance for him. It's yes, about it striking back in the night. Yeah. And that's it. And he doesn't have that epiphany right. until the end of the movie. Right. Which and, I we don't, yeah. and we don't get a whole lot of Bruce Wayne in this. This is a Batman movie. This is the Batman. This is not, you know, fighting his alter ego of what he wants to be for Gotham City. This is, I'm Batman and I'm going to kick some ass and I'm going to take some names and I'm going to you know, protect Gotham city. Now maybe they'll do a little bit more like they did with Christian Bale, you know, as, as sort of that alter ego, Bruce Wayne, Batman kind of not fighting back and forth, but sort of like those dilemmas that he had on, you know, wanting to be in a relationship with Rachel and deciding that, well, I, I got to be Batman because that's what Gotham needs. And, and maybe they'll do more of that. But honestly, I just love this, really kind of gritty young Batman. I'm a detective. I'm not playing detective. I could be a detective that can also kill everybody if I need to. And that's, it's not gadgets. It's not, you know, having a tumbler like, you know, Bruce or like Batman did in the, in the Nolan franchise. This is like a muscle car Batmobile. And I will say, you know, and, and you can probably speak to this a lot more than me, but I've been to the movies enough to where, I love watching great movies, but I also love the experiences of those movies. And the Batman was, was that because I saw it in Dolby cinema. It was my first Dolby cinema experience. It looked great on screen, but it just sounded so amazing with that Atmos track. And I'm imagining that you've watched it on your home theater with Dolby Atmos. I, I, it just was so thumping. It was better than an IMAX experience as far as sound quality goes. And that's hard to beat. Oh, it's, it's one of those favorites you want to kick up that and, and Top Gun Maverick. I've, I've kicked up this recently. As a matter I think we lost George. Hello. I think we lost you for a couple seconds there. Um, not sure what you said after kind of talking about the uh, rewatchability of that Atmos uh, track. Oh, well, you know, what I said, I've watched it mm -hmm. and I've watched Top Gun Maverick. Okay. Oh, yeah. Another. I've got a, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a 12 inch subwoofer right now. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, they'll give you workouts. So and I'm, I'm excited to see what they do. Obviously, they've got the Colin Farrell Penguin series that'll be on HBO Max at some point here in the next year or two. It actually um, wasn't canceled. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on that note, too, the uh, the Ezra Miller Flash is not canceled, and it looks like they would prefer to have Ezra Miller as the Flash moving forward for whatever reason. So Must be that good. I mean, the movie, from what I've read, has been testing well. For about six yeah. months. Yeah. So it must be that good. Or well, that's that's great, but you know, I it's kind of a, looked at it and said, you know what, I can work with this. Well, I'm sure you can work with the film, but you know, continuing on with someone that uh, has some issues going on with the law, I don't, I don't know that that's a great I, look, especially after you've, uh, you know, you you had the bait and switch there in Henry Cavill as Superman. You've canceled Wonder Woman. You've probably um, not moving forward with Jason Momoa's Aquaman, which I don't think is a big deal to me. But Wonder eh. Woman is the, the, after 1984. Wonder Woman's not a big deal with that director. Yeah, yeah it really isn't. Right. But you know, Henry Cavill. There was a lot of. He restored the Snyderverse about him being Superman, which, look, I mean, I don't really care who Superman is. Personally, I'd rather see Henry Cavill maybe transition over to, like, James Bond maybe, but whatever. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think they need they need to have a focus, but if they decide that Matt Reeves can just do his, I don't know if he wants two, three, four, six movies in this series, you know, I would just kind of say, here's your money, do what you want. It can be your own timeline. We don't care. And I don't care if they want to bring Ben Affleck back as Batman. I really don't care. Just don't do it at the expense of Matt Reeves's vision of Batman. Yeah, you know, that would be known as good business. I don't know if Warner Brothers is into that right now. We'll find out. <laughs> it's tough, man. I mean, oof, you know, getting rid of Westworld and the the Nevers were. I mean, just getting rid of shows that, especially Westworld, was a very big. And they surprise. killed half the Looney Tunes. Yeah, and the Looney Tunes, I forgot about that too. Yeah. And they killed yeah. a couple seasons of the Flintstones off, off HBO Max. And it's oh, like, did they? Oh yeah. Okay. Thank God I got the Looney Tunes stuff on, on DVD. Yeah. What are, were there any any other movies? I know Fableman's the Batman, anything else that stand out? And then uh, I might give a couple of movie uh opinions and then we can go into TV and streaming. Well, there there is Top Gun. But see, my my real pleasure is Doctor Strange. Okay, and you know, primarily because of Benedict Cumberbatch and the fact that Sam Raimi basically Sam Raimi, turned yeah. a comic book movie into a horror film. Right. I mean that that was a nice touch. So right. You know, those, okay. and, and towards the end of the year, Glass Onion. Okay, <laughs> have you watched it yet? I have not. No. Um, Daniel Craig, you mentioned him earlier for Bond, is just yeah. superb in this. In this, so subtle, so funny, just so superb in that role as uh, basically yeah. a Southern Hercule Poirot. Uh, that's what he's playing. So you know, right? Well, it's it's funny you mentioned him because you know he 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 will always be James Bond, and that's a good thing because you know what he did with James Bond was was very good. But I remember, especially with Logan Lucky, when that came out and he started it, that was like the first movie he had done that didn't seem to have James Bond attached to it. And, you know, they were selling it like introducing J Daniel Craig as this new actor, even though he's been around for a long time and he's put together great performance after great performance. And that kind of reminded me with the Knives Out franchise here where he can act. And I think a lot of people kind of forgot that because of james bond being sort of this quasi one note character and you know i thought he brought a lot more to that character when he That's played what I'm it say. i mean and he certainly has done that in roles before and after his james bond run i mean his bond was the first one to ever make me cry and i'm like he was like this is a damn james bond movie i'm not supposed <laughs> to cry right but it's like he put James Bond, his James Bond is Shakespearean. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that. That's a good, that's a good take on it. 
Well, I, I'll give you one last chance. I don't think Bones and All is on your favorite list. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we, we, we talked one of my favorites of, of last year, and I know you were kind of in that middle maybe where you liked it, but you didn't love it or you, you didn't hate it. But Turning Red was a very good Pixar movie that deserved a box office run, I felt. And, and I apparently I, you the know, Disney board felt the same thing, or else Bob Bob Iger wouldn't be back there now, would he? True. true. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say that it was on the level of Soul, which had been released a little bit before that on Disney Plus, unfortunately, which that deserved a box office run too. But Turning Red was a very nice, sort of freshening coming of age story of a young woman kind of learning her heritage, her culture, but also wanting to be independent and herself. And, uh, you know, I think it was a, a, a it was, of course, well animated as most Pixar movies are, but uh, just a, a nice sort of refreshing take on that coming of age story where we always like to see young men in the coming of age exactly. role. And that's what that's what it, it's different perspective. It's yeah. representation. I get I, I yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I get what you're saying. So I, I enjoyed it probably a little bit more than you, but I think I've enjoyed with the, with the exception of soul. Cause I think we're both on the same level of enjoyment for soul, but uh, I also enjoyed light year probably a little bit more than you did. But um, I, I just, I thought it was a solid, I'm not putting that on my favorites list, but it was a solid Pixar movie. It was a good unnecessary movie, but it was good nonetheless for me. Uh, but I did also want to point out, and this was a sort of a slower movie year for me, but uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio was also, um, you know, while it wasn't like Pan's Labyrinth level del Toro, I do think it was better than The Shape of Water in that one best picture at the Oscars. Now, I don't know that it should have, but I, I do think that this is, you know, a better effort from del Toro. Just an interesting take on the Pinocchio character. Um, as he did with Pan's Labyrinth, he kind of sets this fa fantasy fairy tale in the midst of a harsh reality, in this case, Mussolini's dictatorship and uh, pokes a lot of fun at Mussolini. So, uh, you know, he has a lot of fun making fun of this, uh, this dictator, but then also just beautiful animation and production design on a stop motion production. It was just well crafted and for being a, a stop motion puppet, really emotive. Their faces were emotive. They cried. They they showed that emotion, but it also made you feel the emotion. Um, and just a, a really well-crafted, probably the best Pinocchio out there other than the 1940s classic. So you're saying it's not the, the Tom Hanks... Robert Zemeckis promote I, I haven't I haven't seen the Tom Hanks Robert Zemeckis because once I knew that there were two Pinocchios coming out this year, I really didn't want to see. I wanted to see the Del Toro Pinocchio. Not that I don't like Robert Zemeckis; he's a fine director, but he's a little bit more uneven, I think, than than Del Toro. And I thought Del Toro would give me a little bit different take on the Pinocchio, whereas I thought is this going to be like the live action Lion King and Aladdin where it's basically a shot for shot remake with maybe a little bit of, you know, manipulation here and there. So I, I was kind of holding my, my sights out on the Del Toro Pinocchio, not the Zemeckis Pinocchio. Fair enough. But now that we've seen all of the Pinocchios here, let's just stop making Pinocchio for a little while. Yeah, please. 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 Even Del Toro. I don't even want Del Toro to make if he said, "Oh, I've got a great idea for no, I don't want to see any more Pinocchio." We, we're, I think we've we've maxed out Pinocchio for at least five to ten years, maybe. Fair enough. And then, of course, the Batman, as we talked about, another one of uh, my favorites, even though it came back came out way back in March, but a, a great Dolby Cinema experience and uh, one that I'll never forget. Uh, just a, a fantastic uh, time at the movies. But uh, what about TV? There was a lot of TV that we watched this year at my household. Uh, what was some TV streaming? What what do you what you watch on TV that was some of your favorite stuff? You know, the the n number one, you know, uh, my fondness for Star Trek, mm -hmm. Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. Yeah, but probably the best. I'll say my favorite and the best, and I I'll I'll fight you on this. Okay. Andor. 
And I've heard a lot of people loving Andor. I need to get to it. I got to tell you, George, Disney Plus and me just don't match for whatever reason. And there's a lot of stuff on Disney Plus that I grew up loving. Star Wars. I do enjoy the MCU, but I don't really gravitate towards it, to be honest with you. And I, I still haven't even watched Obi-Wan. I watched like three episodes of The Mandalorian, and I just, I don't know. I just kind of not gotten into Disney Plus for whatever reason. Yeah, it's, look, if we're being realistic, if we're being honest, Star Wars is always meant as this light, light kind of thing. You know what I mean? Right. Escapism. When it was actually trying to deal with serious subject matter, and, and basically the entire thing was about the rise or combating fascism. Okay, and, right. and what's appealing about Andor is it strips that that shiny veneer off, and it's grittier than hell. It's intelligent. It's well written. Written. And I keep going back to the the prequel trilogy where Princess Amidala says in the Senate, so this is how democracy dies with a whimper. Mm. And, you know, Andor takes that concept and it shows you the truth behind the statement and it, it shows you these characters that that stick with you who aren't very for the most part you know you could call them heroes but they're but they're not they're right. flawed people right i mean i don't recall luke skywalker being portrayed with any flaws I mean, he was he was subject to temptation, but that's human. I right. mean, in Andor, you see these quote unquote heroes with straight up flaws, whether they're borderline evil, indifferent, or whatever. Now, the closest you get to that in, 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 in Star Wars, the, 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 the gussied up version is, is Han Solo. But even you can even then you can predict which way he's going to go. Right. Um, Andor is a revelation. Strange New Worlds, man, that's my fondness for Trek right there. And In and <laughs> Out makes a great freaking camp. camp. Yeah. I think the Lincoln Lawyer came out this year. Yeah, yeah, it did. And I recall giving it a mixed review. I, I looked at it again, and it's like, you know, I wasn't fair. It's a great show mm. on Netflix. Um, go, I'll go back to the the best man again. <laughs> that that's definitely a favorite of the year. Um, oddly enough, House of Dragon didn't make the list. Um, well, I, I I watched a lot of TV versus film this year. Um, you know, obviously I in funny enough, my wife and I just started season two of the White Lotus, which is it's still very fun. I mean, uh, this time around, like before it was more, you know, wealthy class warfare and very uh, you know, dark comedy. And and this time they they use sort of the the idea of, of sexual power, people having sex, you know, different couples different situations. And, you know, Mike White's done a great job just uh, just biting social commentary. The first season was really a revelation. This season is, is really just as good. I think we have like three episodes left. I can't wait to kind of see how that ends. So uh, the white Lotus continues its run uh, as a, as a very funny show and just a very uh, sort of insightful show on, on just relationships, power dynamics and, uh, can't wait to see if they continue. It looks like they're going to continue on. I think my favorite show of this year, and I know I talked about it um, during the summer when we were watching it as it was a weekly Friday night HBO dump, but the rehearsal with Nathan Fielder. He he once did the the show Nathan for You on Comedy Central years ago where he would you know use his business acumen to help out struggling small businesses. Here he is 
thrusting himself into people's lives again. But in this case, he's actually helping them sort of rehearse big moments in their lives. And I will say this, and this was a post Emmy uh, nomination show. So it's going to be next year, not this year's Emmys, but Anna La Madrid, I don't know if I'm saying her name right. I am Anna La Madrid or however she says it. She deserves to be nominated in some category. And I don't know what category because this is a documentary show, but also a comedy show. But this is a woman who was an actress that was going to a rehearsal of Nathan Fielder's device to figure out if he's doing the right thing with a certain other rehearsal. So he had like a rehearsal within a rehearsal. It's almost like a uh, Christopher Nolan inception. So she was an actor playing other characters and she was looked at so well that Nathan decided to hire her to play the woman who he was helping decide if she wants to have a family and be a mom and all this stuff. And this woman's impersonation or her, her work as this real life woman that she was playing was so funny that you almost thought that she was the woman. That's how good her performance was as this other woman she was playing. It's a very interesting show. It's a mind F of a show because it's, it really is like a show within a show within a show within a show, but it's well worth your time because at some point you start to think is Nathan Fielder a sociopath or is he just the most brilliant man in the world? Are these people that gullible that they could be, you know, I mean, he, but he literally built like a, an apartment inside of a warehouse so he could rehearse rehearsals of these other things that he was doing so he's going through how his interactions with these people he was helping with actors to make sure that he was doing it the way it should be done because other people might have different thoughts on how they'll react when he interacts with the real people so it's it's a interesting show i'm probably not even describing it well enough because that's how crazy this show is and it really just kind of gets out of hand in a lot of ways, but it's so fun, very interesting. And at the end of the day, um, well worth your time if you're looking for something that you've maybe never seen before, because it's probably something you've never seen before. Um, you know, Hacks as well, season two. Gene Smart is so great, as always. How do we you forget, Mayor, how do oh. we forget Mayor from East, East Town? Well, that was last year. That was 2021. Last year? Okay, that go ahead. Okay. I'm getting so, old. <laughs> yeah, so Mayor, Mayor of East Town was 2021. But Hacks is Gene Smart's just absolute crushing it swan song of a of a of a aging comedian. She just absolutely crushes this. Hannah Einbinder, who is a stand-up comedian that I've not really seen a lot of in, in shows and movies, but she holds her own against a titan in comedy with Gene Smart. And, uh, you know, that show is now one of the shows I was praying that was not going to be cut among the HBO Max, you know, you know, decisions that they made when the merger first happened. They were cutting a lot of HBO Max programming. Thankfully, that was not one of them because it is a show that I could just watch over and over again. And a lot of it is because of Gene Smart's amazing performances. All right. Uh, I, th I did think I do think Peacemaker was in this year. Of course, I could be wrong. So yeah, it was a um, end of the year or a early part of the year, January release, if I'm not mistaken. So there, you could add that to my favorite. So you know, they're just raunchy superhero fun. So <laughs> you know, is there anything that you uh, you know are looking forward to? I mean, I know The Last of Us is going to be premiering here on HBO uh, in mid January. I mean, is there anything that you you maybe missed last year that you wish you could watch or that you want to get caught up on, or maybe some things that you're looking forward to. I am going to start slow horses. Um, Gary Oldman. Yeah. And then that's the big reason, you know, I've, I don't know how many streaming services you have, but I have everyone under the sun and I just took a look at HB or Apple TV plus the other day. And I saw that under originals and I'm like, well, how the hell do you do, do I miss a Gary Oldman series? Right. So I'm going to take a look at that one. No um, 
I'm looking forward to uh, the mayor of uh, the Jeremy Renner series. Oh, yeah. Mayor, mayor of, of Easttown. Uh, East Town. Yeah. Yeah. That premieres in two weeks. Yeah. A lot of good stuff coming in January. And this year, I, hold on a second. <coughs> Okay, let's. I'm not dying now. Okay. You know what? I I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it all. Tulsa Kings with Sylvester Stallone. Okay, I you know I should have asked you if you were able to finish that up. I, I don't think it's finished yet in its run, but uh, I, I didn't know if you had uh, continued watching it or liked what you've seen with uh, everything else going on. That's become must see viewing every every Sunday. I didn't get. I, I got the first couple episodes for review, but I was hooked after the first one. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, um, very exciting. Obviously, I, I, I'm hoping that Ted Lasso season three comes out, even though it might be the last season, but uh, kind of waited and waited and waited for that and, and kind of realized that it just wasn't going to come out this year as they decided to delay a little bit. Uh, to, to do certain things with season three here, but uh, I'm sure that it will uh, be out here sometime this year. Let's hope so. Yes. Foundation is back this summer. I'm okay. looking to see how they pick that up. I'm, I'm Apple TV Plus had a pretty good run this year. I know a lot of people love Severance. Uh, you know, it's got it's generated a lot of buzz, and you know, Pachinko also was another uh, you know multi language drama that came out that a lot of people enjoyed as well. So. I know they had a pretty, you know, we've talked about that where they're more of the quality over the quantity, but they're starting to get a lot of that quantity as well as they continue to release good, solid programming. I'm looking forward to to seeing what they, whether they keep this up. I, I want to see if they pick up some of the slack because everybody else is cutting back. <laughs> right. Apple has got billions upon billions in cash reserves. Yeah. They didn't get that way by taking too many chances. Right. So we'll we'll see what happens with them. They 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 have plenty of stuff I enjoyed this year. Plenty of stuff. Absolutely. All right, George, well, as always everybody can read George, uh, at by George Thomas. You can follow him on Twitter. You can read him on beaconjournal.com. George, great to be back in a new year. I'm sure we'll be uh, talking. I, I don't know if you have anything coming up on the horizon, but I'm sure we'll be uh, getting back together here soon uh, for some more reviews. Yes, sir. Uh, Movie-wise, it's a dead zone. I may or may not have house party next week. Oh, wow. There, there's a certain obligation there because of who it, who it involves. But What's I don't it? Yeah, wasn't House Party supposed supposedly a, on that chopping block initially, or was this? They just they, it was talked about, but I I thought it was chopped with like uh, the Batgirl movie and the Scooby Doo movie. They chopped it, but this had been completed, but they weren't going to release it. But now it's going to get a theatrical release. You know, I I wish I knew, but okay. do you really want to you really want to tick off LeBron James? <laughs> That's true. That is um, true. So, you know, we'll see. I'll see if they screen it at all. I haven't heard anything about a screening. That's going to be the decider there. Okay. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. George, as always, thanks for stopping by. Can't wait to talk to you again. All right, sir. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mooney. Welcome to what is our new Hope Interrupted podcast based on the work from our book, Hope Interrupted, that I co-authored with my good friend, Byron McCauley. Hey, Jennifer. You know, I'm looking forward to this podcast as much as I was look, looking forward to writing this book with you. We hope to interview some uh, high-impact folks as well as have a little fun. We're going to cover stories of hope. To learn more about our podcast and our book, please visit www.hopeinterrupted.com.